This is the third episode of the Reviled Society, an urban-based campaign inspired by the classic module The Veiled Society by David Cook. The characters are a gang of thieves, Marianne, a duelist, Gretel, a spy, Raven, a thief, Helga, a bodyguard, and Klaus, a bounty hunter. They're all second level, and the world is gritty and low magic, similar in tone to Fritz Leiber's Fofford and the Grey Mauser stories. In episode two, the characters infiltrated a masquerade ball at the house of Anton Rodimus, the head of one of the city's three competing merchant families, and they stole a rare bottle of wine from his wine cellar. They managed to escape, but one of Rodimus's maids is mistakenly blamed for the crime. Feeling guilty, the characters return to the mansion a rescuer, escaping through a secret door into the sewers. As the session opens, they're searching for a way out and chance across the corpse of a young woman and recognize her. She is Lucia Weissbier, a member of the Weissbier merchant family. She has bruises on her throat and the characters will recall her seeing her argue with Stefan Munchberger earlier this evening at the masquerade ball. The characters find a number of clues. On the ground nearby is a handkerchief embroidered with the initials SW. Lucia also has a lock of red hair under her fingernails which are encrusted with blood, indicating she may have scratched her assailant. There's also a ladder leading to Lucia's townhouse and there is pitch on the rungs. If the characters ask or if they have a seafaring background, they recognize it as the pitch used for sealing boats. In a mystery, I always recommend including three clues. That way if the players don't pick up on one, there are other ones to guide them in the right direction. And I talk about this in my video, How to Run a Mystery, link to that below. The latter leads to Lucia's townhouse where they find signs of a struggle. The house has been ransacked, the valuables have been stolen, and the door is open. And within just a few moments, the watch will arrive and the characters will have to flee if they want to avoid being arrested. The pitch would lead the characters to the waterfront. At the wharfs, if they ask around about a guy with red hair, that sounds like Red Hans to me. He was throwing a lot of money around yesterday night at the Blue Water Mead Hall. Said he hit a big payday. Come to think of it, he did have scratch marks on his face. Said his girlfriend got mad at him. He was with scabs and a local girl, Itchy Kate. I never ask for social roles or charisma checks if the players ask the right questions or throw a lot of money around. Deathbringer here. Subscribe to the channel and let us know you enjoy this type of quality content. Otherwise, we'll resort to cheap clickbait like Will Disney buy Wizards of the Coast? Is this Gary Gygax's lost second edition manuscript? And is Matt Mercer going to replace Sam with Joe Manganiello on Critical Role? Don't make us do it. Now on with the show. As the characters walk to the Blue Water Mead Hall, they chance across a large crowd. The authorities are fishing out a body floating face down in the water, and guess who it is? Red Hans. Red Hans' body is bloated, but the characters can still find three clues. He has a scar on his cheek where Lucia gouged him. He has long red hair matching the strand from under Lucia's fingernails, and a faintly recognizable purple hooded tattoo on his forearm. And these clues are enough to let the players know they're on the right track. At the Blue Water Mead Hall, asking for scabs or educate leads to an upstairs room that rents by the hour. As the characters approach, they hear a scream. They enter to find Scabs dead with a dagger in his back. Itchy Kate points to an open window. The fog is so thick the characters can't see ten feet in front of them, but they can hear the assassin's boots on the slate tiles and pursue him. I give the characters just seconds to decide if they're pursuing him. Yes or no? Five, four, three. The fog and roof lines make it impossible to use ranged weapons and spells. The only way to catch the assassin is to pursue on foot. I frequently get asked about chase mechanics. I simply have the assassin and the players make a series of increasingly difficult DC checks as they scramble across the rooftops and jump from one roof to the next. The first is 8, then 10, 12, and 15. I narrate the effect of the jump. If they barely make it, I describe them sliding around, struggling to maintain their balance and roof tiles coming loose. If the character fails a roll, they don't fall off. They come to a gap where they feel they can't make it and freeze up, and they're out of the chase. They only fail on a roll of natural one, and they must save DC 15 or take 3D6 falling damage, and I describe them sliding down the roof, clawing at the tiles in the gutter, desperately trying to save themselves. 
Again, they're out of the chase. If they succeed at the roll but the assassin fails, they catch up to him. It becomes a rooftop fistfight with both parties having disadvantage. A natural 20 means the target gets knocked off the roof and must save or take 3d6 damage. If the assassin falls, he's killed. If the assassin and the characters make all four rolls, he drops down to an exterior staircase and the chase continues on foot, ending on the frozen river. At the start of combat, I toss a D4 timer die. When the time runs out, the ice cracks and anyone still on it is going to fall into the water and probably drown. Both the assassin and any PCs get disadvantaged because the ice is slippery. If anyone rolls a 1, they fall into the river and under the ice. If anyone rolls a natural 20, they knock their opponent into the freezing river and under the ice. In my case, Klaus the bounty hunter rolled a natural 20 and the assassin drowned, taking all of his secrets with him. Searching Scab's corpse reveals three clues. A scrap of paper with Lucio Weisbeer's address on it. His boots have dried pitch on them and he has a Veiled Society tattoo on his arm. Again, always give three clues, and I don't require players to make perception checks. If they say they're looking at the boots or they're looking at this person's forearm, I allow them to find the clue. The next day, Stefan Munchberger is arrested for the crime, and violence between the Munchberger and Weisbeer families breaks out in the middle of the street into open warfare, and characters find themselves in the middle of a huge riot. This is straight out of the module. Eventually, the watch arrives and starts clubbing everyone, and during the riot, an agitator leads a few veiled ones on an assassination attempt on the characters. The characters beat them off, the agitator ran, and ended up in another foot chase, which was similar to the rooftop chase, and I rolled a one for the agitator so he fell off a bridge and broke his leg and the characters were able to interrogate him. The agitator is Johann Brunner, an anthropology student whom the players may have previously encountered in the Caves of Carnage. Brunner deals Moonsnow to other students and that's how he was recruited into the Veiled Ones. At first he refuses to talk, accusing the PCs of being fascist puppets of the ruling class. So they stepped on his broken leg until he revealed everything he knows. One, the Veiled Ones have infiltrated every social class. They are everywhere watching everything. Or at least that's what he thinks. Two, the society is organized into independent cells so other members can identify one another. Meetings are rare and always held in different locations. If approached by a member of the society with an order, that member is expected to carry it out without question. And three, Burnham was given the character's descriptions and ordered to give them a severe beatdown and given a squad of goons to do it. The thing with planting clues is, again, there has to be three clues, so in case the characters miss one, there are always other clues. And they don't have to solve everything exactly. They have to be what I call directionally accurate. In other words, they strongly point in a direction for the player characters. The players have to give it their best guess. Not everything is going to fit together absolutely perfectly. And sometimes in a mystery, Assassins are just going to come out to kill the player characters, like the bad guys are going to be moving against them too. This is a Raymond Chandler technique. He famously said in a mystery, if you don't know what's going to happen, have someone kick down the door and start shooting and figure out why they were shooting later. At this point, the characters felt they had enough information to approach the Munchburgers and the Weissbier families and arrange a sit down at which they revealed their theory that someone set up Stefan to look like he was the murderer, to pit the families against each other, and they suspect the Rotomus family is behind it and they are somehow connected to the Veiled Ones. Stefan, who's languishing in a prison cell awaiting execution, can confirm the handkerchief is his, but he lost it at the masquerade ball. The Duke who rules the city has given the Munchburgers and Weisbeers strict orders not to attack one another, so both families hire the PCs to put an end to the Veiled Ones, and that's how we begin the final session. Before the final session, I asked my players what they wanted to see in order to make them feel satisfied. And they told me they want to see the Veiled Society and its plot exposed. They want to know who the leader is. They want to get revenge on Anton and Wolfgang, who they suspect of being the leaders of the Veiled Society. And in fact, that's true. And they also want to resolve the plot with Dagmar, Anton's mistress. They've taken a soft liking to. She owes Anton a lot of money and they're trying to, es to help her escape indentured servitude. So those are the plots that they want to see resolved. So I said, okay. And I went to work in my notebook to try to bring those elements together to a successful resolution. So here's my DM's notebook. As usual, I use control panel format with everything I need for the evening on facing pages. 
The Veiled Society is urban based, so this is a flow chart on the left hand side and all of the technical stuff like the maps, hit points, armor class, that's on the right hand side. Each color of the flow chart represents different characters or pairs of characters. I actually enjoy splitting up the party and alternating between each group. There are three different plot lines that dovetail to a conclusion where all the characters participate on a raid on this Moon Snow production facility where street urchins have been kidnapped and forced to package the drug under brutal conditions. The drug lab is highly explosive, so the characters can't just blow it up because there are a dozen children working in the adjacent room. And I realize this is not going to be a deterrent for some groups, but my players have something of a conscience, so they rescue the children before blowing the place up. The players, having destroyed the drug lab, anticipate the Veiled Society will call an emergency meeting to discuss the situation. Gretel, who still works as a maid in the Rotomus household, uses the secret door in Anton's office to spy on a meeting between Anton and his son's Wolfgang <laughs> and Dieter. I suspect we have a spy in our midst, in this very household. But father, who would dare betray us? There can be only one. Dagmar, she must be conspiring with that band of adventurers. Take her to the dungeon. At midnight we will hold a meeting of the Veiled Ones at the Temple of the Horned Skull. There we will make an example of her so that everyone knows the cost of betrayal. <laughs> they leave and Gretel finds the location of the Temple of the Horned Skull on the map on Anton's desk. Now the PCs know where the Veiled Ones will meet and when, and there's a time limit. They have to act quickly in order to save both Dagmar and Stefan Weisbeer. They convince Johann Munchberger to lend them support and conduct a raid. So he sends a couple of dozen Munchberger nephews and cousins to bust heads. Meanwhile, the characters infiltrate the meeting in robes they get from inside Anton's house. Now the stage is set for the climax. Anton pronounces his death sentence shortly after midnight. I toss the D4 timer die. That's how long it'll take for the executioner to strangle Dagmar to death. At that exact moment, the Munchburgers burst in the door. But because the characters are disguised, they can't tell the bad guys from the good guys. So it's a massive free-for-all. I ran the riot much in the same way that I would a siege. I describe the events occurring around the player characters, and they roll for the immediate battle that's right in front of them. I also described the chaos of the scene with Veiled Society members and Munchburger members swinging clubs and bottles. With moments to spare, Gretel and Raven take out the Executioner with a backstab and rescue Dagmar from certain death. Anton and Wolfgang, seeing the battles going against them, flee through a secret door and into the sewers. <laughs> Marion tracks them down and duels Wolfgang in a saber fight. Finally, Marianne lands a killing blow and he sinks into the sewage. As his hand kind of disappears out of sight, much to the cheers and applause of my happy players. But at the same time, Anton got away, the die rolls were against him, and he was able to escape, which again, I didn't plan. But that's okay, he can return to plague the characters in a sequel campaign. I never know how a session exactly is going to end, and I allow the players to dictate where we're going next. This way, the possibility of a sequel is always open, but the players have autonomy, and they can choose what we're going to play. So how does it end? The authorities determined Wolfgang was probably the head of the Veiled Ones and the architect of Lucia Weisbeer's murder. Anton claims he had no knowledge of any such organization and without any evidence linking him to the crimes, he lives to fight another day. The Weisbeer and Munchberger families make amends and the charges against Stefan are dropped. The player characters set up Dagmar with a new identity in another town, far from Anton's clutches but they vow to stay in the city, determined to pursue Anton and his nefarious schemes until he is defeated once and for all. If you want more Reviled Society content, check out Dungeon Craft Patreon to see bonus content, get access to my GM's notebook. Hi, I'm Veronica and I play Gretel. And I'm Marie and I play Marianne. And you can watch us play the Reviled Society live on Patreon. And you can get my house rules Deathbringer at the link below. Thanks to the patrons who make this content possible. We'll see you soon. May all your rolls be 20s. And now for my favorite part of the show, the rap party. If you want to be as irresistible as me, click on the link below and get a Deathbringer t-shirt and watch more Dungeon Craft.